They say that seeing is believing, but we won't blame you if you can't believe what you're about to see with your own eyes in this video. We're about to take a tour of some of the most incredible and awe-inspiring artifacts and discoveries made within the field of archaeology, including some shocking finds that you won't hear about anywhere else. Strap yourself in. It's going to get exciting. We're starting with the story of the Pietro Aselli treasure, which was discovered in the 19th century in an ancient tomb in Bazau County, Romania. These stunning golden artifacts date back to the 4th century, right in the middle of the country's Gothic period. Precious little is known about the Romania of the time, so this treasure discovery is valuable for more reasons than just being attractive to look at. The Ring of Pietro Aselli, for example, is inscribed with runic symbols belonging to the Elder Futhark alphabet and has been a mystery ever since their discovery because they defy any attempt to translate them. On other pieces, there are depictions of figures wearing Greek-style clothing, some of whom sit on thrones and are surrounded by women. They might be representations of ancient Gothic rulers or they could even be images of deities worshipped by these enigmatic ancient people. Nobody knows who the treasure originally belonged to, but the most popular theory is that they were part of the personal collection of Athanaric, a legendary leader of the Gothic Tervingi tribe during the 4th century. Placing a value on the treasure is almost impossible, but it would definitely run into the tens of millions of dollars. While archaeologists and historians are sometimes guilty of trying to infer meaning from any markings made on ancient objects made by people prior to the invention of written language, there might be something to be said for the idea that the marks on the Urnfield vase are an attempt at either communication or record-keeping. Some experts even believe that the 3,300-year-old object contains an encoded lunar and metaphysical message. The history of the artifact is shrouded in mystery. We believe that it was probably found in Germany, but there's no record of it, until it turned up in a private German collection in the 1960s. Normally, that would open up the possibility that the artifact is a hoax, but testing has proven its age and suggests that it came from a proto-Celtic Urnfield culture of the Late Bronze Age. It was probably used to store food. The 339 designs marked onto its surface appear to resemble the phases of the moon, while the more arcane-looking symbols have been theorized to be related to an ancient form of fortune-telling on the grounds that astrology and astronomy were one and the same during ancient times. Speaking of puzzling engravings on ancient objects, Archaeologists still don't know what to make of this stone artifact that was found in the Shuandago Paleolithic site in northern China in the 1980s. The object is approximately 30,000 years old. It was the first non-organic engraved artifact ever found in China. Testing has ruled out the possibility that the marks on the surface were caused by any kind of natural phenomena, including weathering or trampling by animals. So whoever made these marks at the time did so on purpose. Unfortunately, we have no idea what they meant by the markings, and we probably never will. The lines are straight and were made within moments of each other, so it might be that they're nothing more than a means of counting. But it would be nice to know for sure. If we're to assume that the people of 30,000 years ago were able to count in an organized fashion, it's not too big a jump to assume they might also have been capable of more advanced forms of mathematics or communication. Of all the ancient cultures who once lived on mainland Europe, the Etruscans are among the most enigmatic. The center of their civilization was just north of what's now Rome in Italy, where they lived in Vulci, Osteria. A few years ago, a 2,700-year-old Etruscan tomb was excavated there and found to contain a puzzling pair of silver hands. The hands are made of a thin foil of copper and silver alloy with a gold leaf applied to the fingernails. They couldn't have been worn as gloves and are too delicate to have served any practical purpose, so they presumably had meaning in the context of the life of the woman buried inside the tomb. 
Aside from the hands, archaeologists also found painted beads, a brooch made of iron, a black ceramic pot, and just to make things even more confusing, an Egyptian scarab depicting the falcon-headed goddess Horus. The tomb has three burial chambers connected by a long corridor with an atrium open to the sky and bears little similarity to any other Etruscan tomb found in the area. Archaeologists have speculated that the hands might have belonged to a wooden funerary dummy known as a spiraliton, but there's no sign of any such dummy in the tomb. The mystery of the tomb of the silver hands is, therefore, unsolved. Nobody ever said that treasure is easy to find, but so long as you're capable of following a few clues, it can be done. Polish archaeologist Dr. Adam Kedzierski heard a local legend about a buried treasure hidden in a village close to Slesko. He knew he had to solve the 900-year-old riddle that claimed to hold the key to its location. Working on little more than a clue that the treasure could be found at the intersection of three plots of land in the north of the village and the stories of a local priest, Adam unearthed the treasure after three days of digging in late 2020, succeeding where dozens had failed in the centuries before. His reward was a 12th century collection of jewelry and coins that once belonged to a Ruthenian princess the sister-in-law of medieval Polish ruler Bolesław the Rymouth. One pot of coins, seemingly out of place and not related to the rest of the treasure, was full of 2nd century Roman denarii. It's said that the princess buried the treasure before fleeing Poland with the intention of coming back for it one day. Nobody knows whether that's true or not, but then again, until Adam found the treasure, nobody was sure whether any aspect of the story was true. When archaeologists found a tiny gold casket inside an ancient shrine below a Buddhist temple in Nanjing, China in 2016, they already knew they'd come across something valuable. When they opened it, however, they found something that might prove to be more valuable than gold, a human skull fragment that's said to belong to Siddhartha Gautama, the founder of Buddhism. Boxes like this are known as stupas because they're used as part of Buddhist meditation rituals. The box is around 1,000 years old, not old enough to have existed at the same time as the Buddha. That doesn't mean the skull fragment couldn't have been placed inside it at a later date. The inscription inside the lid of the box says it was made during the time of Emperor Zhengzhong and explicitly states that the bone is Siddhartha Gautama's. There's also an accompanying story about Buddha's remains being divided into 84,000 pieces and 19 of them being sent to China. The story cannot be proven, of course, but it's been deemed impressive enough for the stupa and its contents to be interned at the Kixia Temple by Buddhist monks for safekeeping. Human beings have been drinking wine for as long as they've known how to crush grapes and produce it and that practice goes back a long way. In April 2013, archaeologists discovered a 1,500-year-old wine press in Jerusalem, Israel, and right next to it, a Christian lantern. The lantern is covered in Christian crosses and might help to shed new light on conditions in Jerusalem during the Byzantine era. The artifacts were found in the ruins of an ancient settlement close to the city of Ashkelon and are unusual for more than one reason. The lantern is significant because items like this, decorated with such obviously Christian markings, are rare for their era. When a candle was lit inside it, it would have projected glowing crosses onto the wall. Whoever owned this lantern was so proud of their religion, they wanted to advertise it. The wine press is also unusual because it's so large, so it might have belonged to someone who produced wine for commercial reasons rather than to enjoy it themselves at home. Wine made in Jerusalem back then was often exported to Europe, North America, and the Mediterranean, and presses like this one are how it was made. Archaeologists like to deal in facts, so it's a little frustrating for them when they encounter objects that have unclear provenance. Sometimes, though, you need a little faith to believe something is real. You definitely need a lot of faith to believe that the Sword of Joyeuse is a genuine artifact. 
but today it's in the Louvre, so there must be plenty of people who are convinced by its tale. Legend has it that this sword belonged to Charlemagne the Great, who was king of France more than a thousand years ago. Both the king and his sword were revered to such an extent that they were said to have supernatural powers. Of the sword, it was said that sunlight reflected off its blade so brightly that it blinded enemy soldiers, and that whoever held it would become immune to poisoning. The sword is such a celebrated relic that the town of Joyeux Ardeci is named in honor of the fact that it's said to have been found there in the aftermath of a battle. Where it went after then is unclear, but historical records claim it was used in the coronation of King Philip the Bold in 1270. While we can say with certainty that the sword in the Louvre is the same one used in that coronation ceremony, it's impossible to say whether it's the same one that Charlemagne the Great wielded a few centuries earlier. Many people watching this video right now will know the pain and frustration of losing an earring. But you'd be especially upset if you lost this gold earring, which was found at the Israeli site of Tel Megiddo in 2010. It's one of a number of gold and silver jewelry items that were found during archaeological digs that year, all of which are around 3,100 years old, and were buried together in a clay vessel. The gold earring is unique and is covered in depictions of wild goats. If it was ever part of a pair, then its companion isn't among the collection, and nothing similar to it has ever been found in Israel before. Archaeologists have hypothesized that the whole jewelry collection might have been imported from Egypt. But this earring would still be unusual even if it could be proven to be Egyptian. The experts feel that the whole collection belonged to a woman, probably a Canaanite woman. But beyond that, they're in the dark about what significance it might have. What does appear to be certain is that the items were hidden and buried deliberately. Perhaps someone meant to come back for them one day, but never got the chance. Staying in Israel for a moment, our next artifact is this tiny copper awl, discovered at the archaeological site of Tel Saf in 2014. It's not only the oldest metal artifact ever found in Israel, but the oldest ever to be found in all of the Middle East. Amazingly, this tiny ornate object is more than 7,000 years old, and that age has implications. It means that cast metal technology must have been introduced to the region far earlier than historians previously believed. While the artifact appears to be green, that's because of centuries of corrosion and oxidation. If you could strip all of that away, you'd find that it was red underneath. Adding to the mystery, the composition of the copper suggests that it came from the Caucasus, almost 1,000 miles away. Not only does this all represent proof that someone was crafting objects out of metal long before anyone else in the area, but it also demonstrates the existence of an extremely long-distance trade or travel network in the region at around the same time. That's a lot of history-changing potential for a little pen. There's an ongoing archaeological mystery that baffles experts in Italy and they're no closer to solving it now than they were two centuries ago when evidence was compiled and the pattern was first noticed. The mystery is that there are thousands of clay effigies of human body parts strewn all over Italy, and nobody has any idea why. One theory is that they're votive offerings left behind at temples or places of religious significance more than 2,000 years ago by people who wanted divine assistance with medical problems relating to the body parts represented by the effigy. Alternatively, they may have had symbolic meanings. A foot might have been left somewhere if you were about to set off on an important journey, for example. An ear might mean you wanted someone to listen to you. What anyone might want from making a clay votive offering of the human intestines, though, is beyond us. Most of the objects were left along the country's west coast over a 500-year period between the 4th century BCE and the 1st century CE, sometimes individually and sometimes in collections of several thousand of the same body part. If we didn't know better, we'd think it was all the work of an elaborate prankster. The idea of owning jewelry made out of animals' stomach growths might not appeal to you. 
but it holds a surprising amount of appeal to a lot of people. These objects are known as bezoars. They're a little like pearls, and they grow around bits of stone that accumulate in the digestive systems of animals. Sometimes they can even grow in humans. Centuries ago, they were popular for their use in witchcraft, curses, and witch doctoring, but they were also sometimes turned into attractive pieces of jewelry. By the 16th century, they'd become highly prized and were often worn as good luck charms or, in some cases, ground into powder and ingested. The most popular of them were taken from inside goats, llamas, deer, and porcupines. It's thought that the practice of harvesting and decorating them began in either Persia or Arabia during the first century and eventually reached Europe around 500 years later. Queen Elizabeth I of England was known to be a huge fan of bezoars and had one set into her favorite ring. They eventually fell out of favor at the start of the 19th century when people became a little warier about where they came from. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.